Hello team and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself Jonathan MSP. This is Ukraine War News Update for the 11th of September 2023. Oh, that's 9-11. Um, fair of thought, yes. Uh, anyway, this is the first of two news parts as per normal at the moment for concerning the Ukraine war. Uh, and let's go to where we normally start, which is the Ukrainian general staff figures for the Russian losses for the day before. All the usual caveats apply, and they are in the uh, description below. Provided by Ian Davin or Jan Davin. Uh, thanks for that, one of my viewers. Okay, so the Russians apparently lost 580 uh, personnel yesterday, so that's a fairly high number in that range. Uh, that we've been expecting six tanks and 12 apvs though slightly less than we have seen on a previous few days or over the last week but still a consistently uh, uh you know difficult number for the russians as in 12 apvs lost in a day ain't great uh, and six tanks is considerable even though we have seen over 10 lost uh, over the last few days 28 artillery systems is still an incredibly large number of artillery pieces and i think as i discussed the other day there's got to be a lot to say for the ukrainian attrition of russian air defenses which then allows a lot of first person view drones to be roaming around hitting these artillery pieces i think three anti-aircraft warfare systems is a large number considering there's just over one a day uh no there's less than one a day goodness we're in day 500 and whatever ah oh, i've been getting my maths wrong recently I've been thinking in terms of 365. There is less than one a day uh, in air defense systems. So three lost in a day is really, really significant. Um, okay, 35 drones. It's not from last night, from, but from the night before. 32 vehicles and fuel tanks is another huge logistical nightmare for the Russians. They are losing so many vehicles that they are using civilian vehicles some are claiming that the scooby-doo vans and pecankas are being used basically as fuel trucks because they don't have any fuel trucks left to or not enough left to adequately supply the front lines uh, and so you know the first person view drones are taking those vehicles out as well five pieces of special equipment that'll be electronic warfare intelligence surveillance reconnaissance i've seen plenty of footage of like murom m and, and p units of isr being taken out in in random places so plenty of that happening uh let's go and see if we can get a sense of how accurate these claims might be by looking at some of the open source sources for uh equipment losses this is oryx say, saying that 24 he's counted up 24 pieces of russian equipment yesterday uh in, so we have a few tanks uh mainly infantry fighting vehicles though uh as that um yeah, nothing too special to report there. And then reports, so 24 to 10, so that's a 2.4 to 1 ratio of Russian to Ukrainian losses. Ukrainian lost, Ukraine's lost one tank and mainly sort of IFVs and APCs in there. But there is a counter-battery radar, which is going to be a, uh, a real um, a bit of a headache for the Ukrainians because that's going to be kind of higher value sort of equipment than just losing uh, an APC. So if we look at Andrew Perpetua's uh, loss statistics, this is the map I re refer to an awful lot. He is, and by the way, go show Andrew Perpetua some love. He has an expensive map to uphold. Uh, there are ways to donate to him on his, uh, on, on the map itself uh, and also on his YouTube handle sort of paypal so you know he i mean i do but he he you know his map is expensive um and he puts an awful lot of work into that so just show him some love if you can and have uh the desire to do so uh so he's seen the a couple of pieces of electronic warfare surveillance stuff so that's the special special equipment category we see on the general staff figures and then a lot of artillery there that fits in with the idea that, hey, uh, they are losing a lot of artillery. Um, what else? Uh, quite a few tanks, I guess, there. In fact, heavier on the tanks than APCs and not so much civilian equipment. And so only really kind of two bits of equipment or is that even? Uh, yeah, so that's Russians there. So two bits of equipment 
that would fall into that 32 uh, piece, pieces lost category there for the Ukrainian general staff. And I think it goes to show that not every bit of footage is going to be released. So if the Ukrainian general staff, for example, have indeed got video evidence of 32 vehicles and fuel tanks being lost in one day, they're not going to bother releasing 32 bits of footage to the to the socials, right? It's just not worth it. What, what are they gain from doing that? All the time and effort and employing someone to, to upload all that stuff. So the odd, the odd Bukanka, the odd, you know, four before or whatever might be uploaded to the internet uh, by a, a particular group here or a particular group there. But in general, uh, you, we, I don't think we should expect to see every bit of footage of every piece of equipment lost. I mean, you might desire it as a random sitting on the internet, but it's not in the best interest of the military. They've got other things to do. They will release things that they desire to do, you know, that, that they think fit into what their remit is. Um, but we, sh we shouldn't expect to see everything. Okay, U Ukrainian losses, a few bits of ISR equipment, APCs and MRAPs, as you'd expect, with the way that the Ukrainians are conducting their maneuvers, their offensive at the moment, which is uh, infantry led, dropping them off with these APCs and MRAPs, and then letting the infantry do the work rather than throwing in heavy equipment. Although, having said that, we have seen quite a bit of tank footage. There's something we haven't seen previously uh, tanks doing some of the heavy lifting around the Robotina area. Uh, but generally, this is what we would expect to see uh, given how Ukraine are going about their uh, offensive at the moment. So, anyway, it still fits into the idea that the russians are losing much more equipment than the ukrainians on a consistent basis i just want to dip into a comment from greg warren here on one of my videos the other day i just like this comment i've had to think about your conundrum uh, what is the conundrum why is ukraine attacking the strongest point of the line with their strongest unit so in the robotina area you know why are they doing this and i think it ties into another issue you've been talking about uh, which is the capacity of both countries to absorb losses to rebuild their military so the reason i'm talking about this is because it fits into the kind of lost statistics let me know what you think. You previously discussed the total population of both countries and losses as a proportion thereof favouring Russia. After some thought, though, which country can afford the loss of institutional knowledge? This is a super important point. Uh, this might be a bit of grim calculus, but if Ukraine loses their best troops, uh, they can train future units with their Western allies. Russia is almost certainly dependent on the survivors of the troops surrounding Robotna to train their future military. And the only real options for cross-training being China, who have a vested interest to not do so, such a great job to keep Russia as a satellite state, North Korea, Iran, uh, or an old Soviet satellite state, which the Russians didn't do a great job of training so they could maintain hegemony over them. So if you consider that no matter the result of the current war, that in 10 to 20 years' time, Russia will try to invade again, Ukraine's strategy of forcing Russia to a trip Russia's best forces at the expense of their own makes a grim sort of sense. Russia isn't capable of replacing these forces if Ukraine can cause devastating enough losses to Russian veterans. Uh, I don't know that that long-term goal is part of what Ukraine is considering now. I just think it's it's what's happening. And it's, uh, you know, uh, law of unintended consequences. Or, like, you intend to do it, but it's, it's not your primary objective. But this is really important. Uh, and I think this fits in with kind of what Lloyd Austin was saying back in April last year, we want to see Russia degraded to such a point they can't do this again, or not in living memory. And I think you'll get, you're, you're seeing this happen. But the Russian, we know that right from the beginning, Russia was sending in their trainers to the front line. So that even like halfway into last year, they had degraded their ability to train their troops effectively. And, you know, who, there, there is no kind of long-term strategic understanding of where the Russian military needs to be. They're just kind of like, ah, throw that, that, do that, do that, mobilize everyone, throw, throw, throw. And OK, well, what about where Russia is going to be in 10 years time? And I think they're going to be screwed in 10 years. Like they're screwed now. And these losses that they are taking uh, mean that, that they are losing institutional knowledge, as Greg rightly says here, uh, in a way that Ukraine probably aren't. Yes, Ukraine have lost a lot of their best troops over the course of the war. And those who had the most experience from 2014 onwards, there is, there had been there has been a lot of loss of Ukrainian um, expertise. However, they also can draw upon NATO, help them regain that in a way that Russia can't. And so I think 
there is an asymmetry there that is really worth considering. So thanks, Greg, for that comment. Uh, right, and this is why it's such, a, such an awesome um, community. Thank you so much for being awesome, everyone. Uh, right, almost everyone. Uh, Getty here says the destruction of the Russian control point for unmanned aerial vehicles, Zala and Lancer on the left bank of Kherson. So the, I'm, I can't show you this video, but the, they are all in linked in the description below. But this is a, another video showing just sense of the stuff that's being destroyed, right? So this is a Zala and Lancet uh, launching control point. I, I talked to you about another one the other day getting destroyed, um, uh, a Lancet launching uh unit if you like here here is another one it's just this kind of hit i think is important in degrading russia's ability to do certain things uh, here we've got destruction of a russian r330 bmw station of the borisoglebs 2 electronic warfare complex by gimlers so high mars are being used to take out these high value systems which then reduces the ability of you of russia to defend against things like drones so not only their own drone launchers getting taken out but their electronic warfare systems which then allows ukraine to use their drones with greater impunity which then translates into massive artillery piece losses okay as a result of things like fpv drones flying around doing their stuff unhindered right so this is all like fits into that picture the ukrainian a counter battery radar however was destroyed this is the one i mentioned from andrew perpetua so this is uh no from oryx sorry so this is that an tpq 50 counter battery radar so it's not all one way uh traffic is it so here we have a, a zala lancet the source didn't mention the location um but this is the fourth confirmed destruction of this radar so that is going to be a sore loss for the ukrainians and here we have a Ukrainian first person view hitting a Russian air defense system, which leads to the detonation of the BC and the launch of Russian boys in panties into orbit. It's P style one. Basically, that's a huge explosion going on there of this air defense system. So, obviously, the ammunition going off there. I don't know what the system was, um, but you know, that's a high value target being taken out. And again, fits into this idea that if you attrit the Russians in these particular categories, then the Russians are less able to put up further resistance to more of this. And it becomes a bit like a snowball effect. Uh, and I think that's what we've seen over the last month or so. But I, there's something I want to talk to you about that I had lined up for the frontline piece segment in the next video. But actually, it's too long uh, and it's too much I want to talk about there. Uh, so I, I might leave it to my actual frontline video. But it's, it's you, you know, I've talked to you before about um going from high to high to deep uh, you know dreams are sweet and sour uh, like how do i feel about the counteroffensive is it going well yes it's going well, no it's not uh, yes it is no it's not and you kind of look at all these different sources and your mood goes up and down with that but there is a very core cool part of me that thinks that possibly this might be an absolute success that sounds really, really positive. I, I wonder whether this kind of attrition, if it's looked back on by military historians, there is, there is something to be said about how this just could be an exemplary, um, uh, or just might, just might be a, a, a really fantastic example of how to do things methodically and uh, how to hamstring an opposition in in such a fundamental way that the, you can then you know take advantage of that going forward so i i think there's been a phase of two months here that could be and there's a bit of speculation here and there might be a bit of hope but it could be that the ukrainians are doing an absolutely fantastic job of the dirty work that isn't like oh look they've taken 10 kilometers worth of of land here like isn't that and so when you have mainstream media kind of trying to find news stories to report on and it's been yet another day of stuff like this happening they don't report on that and so therefore people think oh this is a stalemate they're not making any progress but this is massive progress this is kind of where i'm going that i think that we might be in 
in a position soon where you can look back and go, Ukrainians did an absolutely exemplary job there in, in destroying Russian capabilities such that they can then attack and then take the land. And that taking the land might be, might even go into next year. It might be in spring next year. But if you don't do this work, you can't do that. And this is why I talk about different levels of objectives. And I talk about the land objective being your overarching objective. But it's not your most pressing objective. This is your most pressing objective. And so they are spending extra time doing this that will hopefully have benefits going forward. And this is kind of what Tendar is talking about. Ukrainian forces are cracking the Russian defense line step by step. They drive a chisel into the lines and they widen the rift. So that's talking about the kind of territorial ways of doing that, but also in the ways that they're hitting logistics, in the ways that they're hitting uh, certain elements of, of the Russian forces. And I think, you know, when you start looking at all this stuff, that the Ukrainians might be doing a really good job and we are kind of underselling how much of a good job they are doing. But there could be a lot of hope in there uh, that, that's driving my evaluation. So, you know, it's something we can talk about. Ukrainian tanks are getting involved, as I've said, in certain places here. They're shelling Russian positions near Novokropivka. This is what I showed you yesterday. Uh, that has led to kind of a belief that the Ukrainians have actually pushed on in that. And it's interesting. I was talking about that saying, well, actually, that surely shows the Russian lines have moved uh, further back. And that's what mappers are now saying today. Now, I want to talk to you just really quickly uh, about because, you know, when you talk about losses, some of these losses are damaged equipment that is abandoned, right? Or, or it just gets stuck. So here we have a, a tank being evacuated by a Pioneer Panzer 2A1 DAX engineering vehicle. So this is a German provided vehicle that is doing some, you know, literally heavy lifting here to get this Ukrainian tank. Although I think reporting from Ukraine reported that as a Russian tank, it's not as a Ukrainian tank. Uh, that is being, yeah, that that will then be able to be retrieved and sent back, and if it's if it's damaged at all, get it up and running and get that back to front line. So this is really important. These kind of engineering vehicles, I think the Ukrainians have have more of these than the Russians uh, and are utilizing them more. The flip side is that when you are doing that, you are really vulnerable. So that, that engineering vehicle has to sit there for probably several hours to, to then get this tank out, right, and doing its business. Uh, and that means that, you know what, you are prime target for Russian drones and artillery. So Ukrainian M888A1 uh, ARV was abandoned by Ukrainian forces near Robotina, allegedly, while trying to recover an abandoned M2A2 Bradley ODSSA. Both were damaged by artillery fire afterwards. This is the third confirmed loss of an M88A1. So then when it's then abandoned because it's been hit by maybe it's taken a mortar fire or something that's not too substantial, unfortunately, when it's, these two are just then sitting there, then the artillery can go, well, let's, let's just make sure that they definitely can't be uh, recovered. And then you can turn them into burning hulks uh, and they ain't, ain't going to recover then. So that's your flip side and that's the challenge to engineering vehicles. I mean, they're operating in a battle zone, right? Uh, talk about Russia on fire. Major film village is ablaze in Moscow region. It's a Gorky Leninsky nature reserve. Many TV series and films have been used. Uh, the location near Vidnoy, about 20 kilometers from the capital. Uh, so that looks like a fairly substantial fire going on. Lots of these fires. Uh, but then equally, here's one in Ternopil. So Ternopil is to the west of Ukraine. This is a pretty substantial fire, 9,000 square meters. It's a big old fire. It's a it's a building filled by foam plastic, uh, unknown as to how it started. I don't know that it was like, I don't think it's a drone. It might just be a complete accident. But that's to say that, you know, fires happen, don't they? This may or may not have something to do with the war. I don't know. Uh, right, let's go to strikes. And actually, there's very little to say. So last night, apparently all 12, I believe, all 12 Shahid drones were shot down. And then an unknown drone. A new unknown drone, apparently. Um, the Russians also fired tactical, uh, used tactical aviation on Dnitro Petrovsk, fired Su-34, Su-35 anti-radar missiles, X-31P, and guided aircraft missiles, X-59 or KH-59. No casualties, information is being clarified, so don't know about the missiles yet. But drones were used against Dnitro Petrovsk, Zaporizhia and Mikolaev regions. To let you know where they are, we've got Zaporizhia, Dnipro, and Mikolaev here so in in the southern areas 
Um, I, I've long argued there should be really good air defence systems around Zaporizhia. There might well be now. I think I think they had moved some down. I think they've lost a few as well. But, but my view should be you should have something like some of your best ones really in the Zaporizhia region to give you uh, range over the whole of this kind of battlefield there. Uh, you know, if you look 100 kilometers sort of long range or decent medium range air defense systems uh, to really help out with what's going on in the front line and also to protect Zaporizhia that gets hammered by ballistic missiles and cruise missiles routinely. Uh, OK, as far as the Ukrainians hitting targets, you know, Melitopol, there are explosions. And also um, here in Donetsk itself, uh, I say itself, it's it's a major city that's long been occupied 2014 and whatnot here we have the uh the, the previous annexation lines and donetsk is is within that Ad abdivka famously right next to it uh but yeah donetsk is is hit or was hit again yes they looks like hit a number of times uh and that could be uh artillery as much as sort of high mars or anything else because it is within artillery range and then two foreign aid workers sadly were killed and two others injured in a Russian missile attack near Chasivyar, Donetsk Oblast. So they were driving, I think, in a vehicle when their vehicle was was possibly targeted or randomly hit. I don't know. They are Canadian and Spanish citizens. Another two volunteers from Germany and Sweden were severely wounded. So it's really, really sad. You know, these people are doing are going out of their way. Their lives are dedicated to helping other people voluntarily. And uh, those aid workers are no more and that's terribly sad right moving on to other bits and pieces now uh russian military power has degraded significantly over the past year and a half says kirillo uh, budanov head of ukrainian intelligence uh, the war quote the war has not benefited the putin regime the economy is not holding up this is a fact and i would agree with that according to him the professional army of the russian federation in the general sense was over last fall and now they are fighting as mobilized soldiers and then we can go back to our friend greg warren and say yeah and Budinov agrees with you there. You know, I, th I think this is definitely true. The professional Russian army has degraded so badly that they, they ain't doing anything meaningful for the next 10, 20 years, is my opinion. Right, I almost reported on this the other day. So the claim is that the Russians are using K-51 tear gas grenades on Ukrainian soldiers, which are prohibited by the Chemical Weapons Convention and the Geneva Protocol. Uh, there, there, is, there have been these claims, and this is what I almost reported the other day, that the Russians are using chemical weapons such as this to um, attack trench lines, and then that forces the, Rus the Ukrainians to run out of their trenches to get away from the gas. Uh, and as they get out of the trenches, then they get hit by artillery and machine gun or whatever, whatever it is, mortar. Uh, and that, it's a way of flushing the trenches to then hit, hit those uh, soldiers. Now, you can argue about, I don't want to get into a philosophical argument about chemical weapons like this, but I, I've argued previously that it's a somewhat arbitrary line. We like to get really up, up in arms about chemical weapons, but to use something like tear gas, it ha, the, it's not, you're not allowed to use tear gas, but you can blow someone's head off with a whatever conventional weapon. Like you, can, you can make someone limbless with a mortar, but you can't, you know, a bit of tear gas is no-go. I find these kind of distinctions somewhat arbitrary. I mean, it's a really difficult thing to, to try and draw a demarcation there. So one is acceptable and the other isn't when one actually kills you and the other doesn't. You know, how can we outlaw something that doesn't kill you but not outlaw something that kills you? So be, be wary about, like, you know, I, pr I probably should do a segment on, on the philosophy behind trying to make demarcation lines on continua, which is at best arbitrary but uh anyway russian colonel Je that's not me advocating chemical warfare by the way but it's just saying those those lines are fuzzy and you might find it's more difficult to to make arguments than you previously thought you know it's it's easy sometimes to rely on intuition uh, but sometimes intuition isn't like rationally justifiable a uh, russian colonel general andrey mordichev says the war against Ukraine is only a stepping stone and that Russia will wage war against their con other countries in Eastern Europe. It's a statement by a colonel general. Europe should listen closely. Right, go and listen to my... It got restricted for whatever reason, my 
um, extra video yesterday, which means it doesn't have adverts. You guys don't care about that. But actually, I think what also happens is they don't throw it on the algorithm. So actually, people don't find out about the video. So, but I had a bit of a rant yesterday, and one of the things is we should not we should not impress upon Ukraine to do uh, diplomacy with Russia anyway, because it's not up to us to tell another country that they should give up certain areas of their land. Right? You wouldn't like that if someone told you to give up parts of your country to an invading force. So we shouldn't expect that of, of Ukraine. Like, it's not up to us to, to, to dictate to Ukraine. It's up to Ukrainians to decide what they want to do diplomatically. Right? So there's all that. But also, why would you do diplomacy with a country who has gone against, is already invaded from 2014? It, it's, it has then it's done all sorts of illegal stuff. Like, you're getting into bed with a, with a wolf. Don't do it. Uh, it, yeah, but then when, as I said yesterday, when the propagandists are saying Ukraine should be should cease to exist, right? We should destroy Ukraine, its history, its culture, its language, its people. Like, why would why should we force those people to do diplomacy with the country that's saying that on their national television? Right now, let's add this into the mix. So you've got a colonel general saying that. Oh, by the way, Ukraine is just a stepping stone. We will attack uh, Eastern Europe after that. Oh, yeah, Let, let's, let's tell Ukraine to do uh, a diplomatic deal with those guys. But you've got the army. You've got national TV pro propagandists that will be sanctioned, by the way, by the Kremlin. Telling, you, telling us all this terrible stuff. And yet you've got some of us, some people saying... Oh, you know, Vivek Ramaswamy. Oh, we should do we should do a deal with with Russia. Let's let's stop this war. Listen to what the Russians are saying, and listen to what the Ukrainians are saying. That's all. All you need to do. Listen to both sides, and so, and you'll re soon realize that yeah, diplomacy ain't going to cut the mustard there. And this is kind of what um, Zelensky was saying last night as well. By the way, a bit more news that Zelensky was saying basically no to diplomacy as well. They have our territory type thing, you know, and rightly so. And kind of talking about stuff, okay, this is not really news, but this is, here is a, a, a Turkish a reporter saying, I feel like fighting disinformation is a lost cause on Twitter or X or whatever you call it. Now, don't, you don't have to think about Twitter or X here. This is not, not a whinge about Twitter. It is, but it's a whinge about the whole information landscape. It's even worse in Turkish. Numerous self-declared news accounts pushing out lots of BS. There is no way to fight it. We have someone who is like so depressed about the information space that they're like, give up, just give up. This information has won. I, and I just, what, did just want to warn my viewers here, and you may see me as disinformation or misinformation or whatever, always check your sources. Think about why I'm saying things. Think about why everyone is saying things. Think about yourself. The easiest person to fool is yourself. If you want something to be true, you will go and find news sources to, to find that being true. So if you're against, I don't know, if you think climate, climate change is not happening and you're, you're against that, you will go and find news sources to defend that. Rather than say, well, what does the actual science say? You will, you will look for fringe scientists. Same with the, the, the war, like Colonel McGregor. If you're against this, war, if you're sort of pro-Russian, anti-American imperialism or something like that, you will go to Colonel McGregor and say, I'm going to believe this guy. Rather than saying, well, what's the consensus view about what's really happening and what should be happening and what the military think? Like, don't go to the fringe guy. I could bore you with, like, I've written a book, right, on, on uh, how to find knowledge, right? Uh, it, on a book on epistemology. So I, I kind of know a little bit about what I'm talking about. And the BBC wrote a great article here. It's from BBC Future called The Greatest Security Threat of the Post-Truth Age, right? And talking about how, in terms of the terms national security or cybersecurity may be familiar, but what about epistemic security? Well, this is the security of truth, right? Ep epistemology is study of knowledge and truth. If societies lose it, they will struggle to tackle some of the most worrying crises of the 21st century, from pandemics to climate change. So, in other words, like this is a fight now we are having over the information space. And, you know, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So, if someone presents to you something that is non consensus, is fringe, and is an extraordinary claim, they must have extraordinary evidence to support that. If they don't have extraordinary evidence, you are not justified in believing it. Don't believe fringe stuff because it sounds cool or it fits in with your political ideology or whatever. Don't believe stuff and then look for evidence. Build the evidence up to a belief. Right? That's why on that book I'm talking about, 
we have a, a brick wall here, right? Build up to your conclusion. Don't start with your conclusion and work backwards. And this is super bloody important. And, and I just, I know this isn't particularly newsworthy, like it's not breaking news, but just question yourself all the time about why you believe certain things. All the time. I do it. And I'm not perfect. Of course I'm not. And I suffer from all the same cognitive biases as you do, right? But we need to protect the truth. And we need to protect good, accurate information in this world. And this fight is just beginning. And when you have people who are involved in reporting the news saying, I'm giving up on, on this disinformation war because it's lost, like that's super, super sad. And that is to say that epistemic security is one of the biggest threats to, to us going forward. That, the, the battle for truth in, in this post-truth world is, is the most serious of battles for the world. Because if you're, if you, if you're believing in inaccurate stuff, then you're voting in politicians who also believe in accurate stuff, which means they are going to enact policies that are based on inaccurate information, which means it all goes wrong. So just be careful, guys.